Uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview before we get into the details of the structure. So virus capsids, uh, these are composed of protein and they encapsulate nucleic acid. Now the nucleic acid can be single-stranded, double-stranded RNA, DNA, depending on the type of virus. And there may be lipid components based on whether the virus is an enveloped virus or a non-enveloped virus. In terms of uh, conformations, there can be icosahedral structures, helical, oblate, which is uh, sort of like an extended icosahedron, or head tail structures. Uh, the genome of a virus also, apart from the capsid proteins, it also codes for uh, non-structural proteins and scaffolding proteins. Non-structural proteins are those which uh, help in virus replication, interaction with host, um, host uh, immune suppression, uh, etc. And then scaffolding proteins are those which uh, actually help the virus capsid form. So these may or may not be part of the final capsid, but they actually help the capsid. Uh, proteins come together to form a structure. And um, uh, this was actually an observation a very long time ago that the viral genome contributes less mass than viral proteins. So considering that the proteins are actually coming from the genome, the idea uh, that was proposed was that uh, the viral capsid is probably made up of multiple copies of uh, these structural proteins since the genome is contributing less mass compared to the proteins. Um, so uh, again, as you can see, various types of uh, structures based on icosahedral symmetry, and then one example of helical symmetry. So um, yesterday we had a discussion about what uh, goes on to making an icosahedron. If you remember, you have these uh, hexagonal lattice, and then you can try to remove one triangle from this hexagonal lattice and make a pentagon, uh, pentamer, so to speak. And then uh, these pentameric and hexameric uh, subunits basically get together and, and make that, uh, make a capsid. And uh, again, if you remember, uh, you have these, uh, the faces are basically uh, equilateral triangles, and then you have the five-fold axis of symmetry there, and uh, three folds and two folds um, uh, here. So the two folds are in between edges right here, and the three folds are in the middle of the triangular faces. So, um, so the whole point of having an icosahedron is uh, so that, uh, from the perspective of the virus, so the tertiary structure of the capsid protein, which goes on to making this uh, closed shell, is uh, that is non-symmetric. And however, it needs to make uh, something of a stable closed structure to protect the genome. So the idea is if you can get away with less genetic information, so smaller proteins, large number of smaller proteins, and uh, if these can reach something of a minimum free energy state and a closed stable structure, so the genome can be protected as much as possible. So this is more or less the, um, the rationale behind uh, forming an icosahedron. So, um, so again, um, just to rationalize the genetic information versus number of proteins and the virus tries to minimize the genetic information, uh, is if you have smaller subunits, then you have less genetic information that is required. And uh, of course, this also means in addition to the virus not having um, not having to carry around a lot of genetic information, the chances of uh, having mutations is less if you have uh, less uh, of uh, genome. And uh, this uh, requires then, we're, having, we're talking about a greater number of subunits of smaller size to form a same volume. So this makes the icosahedron very, very stable and it's very essential in order to protect the genome. Now, uh, the early information about virus uh, capsid organization, how the proteins are organized, what are the structural constraints, whether the uh, uh, quasi-symmetry um, is preserved or not. So all of this information initially actually came from X-ray crystallography. So um, there were three structures published around 1980, uh, tomato bushy stunt virus at 2.8 angstrom, southern bean mosaic virus at 2.8 angstrom also, and then satellite tobacco necrosis virus at 3 angstrom. 
So these were all, um, if, uh, you want, uh, if you can see, uh, really stable small plant viruses, which were easier to produce in large amounts and to manipulate and get stable crystals of. And from there, we have had many crystal structures. Um, and uh, this we will talk about a little bit. Uh, adenovirus, which is a fairly large virus in 2010, the crystal structure was published at 3.5 angstrom. So we started off with viruses that were relatively easier to handle and deal with smaller viruses, so to speak, all with diameters uh, within a limitation of, let's say, 28 to 32 nanometer. Now this, we are talking about a fairly, very large virus. Uh, the, the triangulation number is 25. And this was correspondingly uh, difficult to do. So um, again, if you remember from, from yesterday's talk, um, how do you actually make a larger virus from, this, uh, from the same icosahedral setup, but uh, you have more than 60 subunits? How would you organize everything to make, uh, make a capsid? So again, the concept of uh, triangulation number comes in. And depending on various values of H and K, you can have uh, different uh, size viruses uh, with different triangulation numbers. So the, if you have more than 60 subunits, these can be accommodated by first expanding the triangular faces and then subdivision so that your proteins have uh, specific uh, um, areas to occupy in that, uh, in that triangular facet. And uh, the triangulation number, again, is defined by this equation. So there are three classes based on the type of triangulation numbers that can be formed. If H is more than or equal to 1 and K is 0, then uh, the triangulation number is 1, 4, or 9. These viruses fall in one group. Uh, H and K both more than 1. So these are triangulation numbers uh, e equal to or more than 1. So these are viruses with triangulation numbers 3, 12, 27. And then lastly, so there's a skewed class where H and K may both be more than one, but they may not be equal to each other. So uh, these, uh, these skewed classes have uh, either levo or dextro enantiomorphic configuration. So the configuration, enantiomorphic uh, configuration has to be defined when you are mentioning the virus. So you can't just say T equals seven. So it has to be T equals seven dextro, or in case of rotavirus, T equals, uh, T equals uh, 13 levo. So depending on, uh, on the values of H and K, you can define the triangulation number in this fashion. So you will see here that uh, triangulation number 5 uh, cannot be made. 8 cannot be made because it does not satisfy the equation. But you will see later that uh, there are cases where this uh, framework is, is broken a little bit. There are exceptions to everything, obviously. So um, if we again go to the structure, so this is the structure of a T equals 3 uh, virus capsid. So what you have here is that you, have, you may have the same protein, or you may have three different proteins forming each triangular face. And uh, as I said, the virus is typically made from pentamers and hexamers. So the pentamers are right here. So if we say that the subunits are A, B, and C, which make up that triangular face, then the A subunits would contribute to the formation of that pentamer. And then the B and the C subunits would be here, which would contribute to the formation of the twofold or the threefold right here. Uh, so this also uh, leads, so there are a total of 12 pentamers and uh, 10 um, T minus one hexamers per, uh, per virus. And we will see that this, this may differ actually. So there are exceptions to this rule. And um, quasi-equivalence also is a, is a very uh, interesting point that if you're dealing with just one protein, then you are looking at quasi-equivalent contacts, which, um, which is explained in this, uh, this figure about T equals four virus. This is uh, N omega V. And uh, in this virus capsid, you have, uh, this is T equals four. So you have A, B, C, and D, four subunits per icosahedral asymmetric unit. And um, so although these are the same proteins that are forming this uh, icosahedral asymmetric unit and the rest of the virus, you can see that, 
you can see that the contacts between the proteins are slightly different. So even though it's the, it's the same protein and it's interacting with exactly the same protein in terms of genetic interaction, the subunits at C and D have a flat contact, whereas the subunits in A and, in a and B have a bent contact. So this is where your quasi-equivalence come in, comes in, that uh, you may have the same protein, but it may be organized slightly differently in order to form the exact, uh, the actual capsule. So, um, so as I mentioned, there is uh, definitely departure from icosahedral organization in, in various cases. So one example are the papillomavirus, uh, so this is a structure, a schematic of bovine papillomavirus, which uh, was published um, in 1992, a, a virus from the same family, I think, was published in 1992 by Liddington. And uh, later on, uh, the bovine papillomavirus structure was solved by Wolf uh, and published in PNAS in 2010. So what is very interesting about this, uh, this virus was that um, biochemical analysis said that it has 360 subunits. Now, if you divide that by 60, so you're talking about more or less a triangulation number which cannot be fulfilled by the terms of the equation of the triangulation number. So eventually, after a lot of analysis and going back and forth, and some people actually were certain that this has 420 subunits, not 360, but uh, after a lot of uh, discussion and after the actual uh, structure was solved, it was found that instead of the pentamers and the hexamers that you find in an icosahedral capsid, this is actually made from pentamers. So this is made from 72 pentamers. So this is the correct position for a pentamer. So that, that is that uh, uh, five-fold axis of symmetry where a pentamer is supposed to be. But the rest of the positions where a hexamer is supposed to be is also occupied by pentamers. And there is a, is a strong connection between the pentamers. So uh, they have this uh, helix that actually extends out. And there is an extensive network between these hexamers and the pentamers, so, uh, which is what holds the structure together. So this actually goes against the principle of virus structure organization. Interestingly, if you remove this um, little extension from the capsid protein, the virus becomes a standard T equals 1 capsid because it just, uh, it just doesn't have these extensions to make this into this, uh, this kind of a capsid. Another, uh, another departure from icosahedral organization is uh, in the case of adenovirus. So in the case of adenovirus, in the hexavalent positions, instead of a hexamer, you have 240 trimers. So this is shown by uh, these, uh, boxed out by these hexagons here. So there may be departure in some cases from icosahedral organization, but more or less the outline of what, uh, what we were discussing remains, remains correct. Now, uh, Crystal structures, as I mentioned, of several viruses were, discover, uh, were uh, determined in the uh, 1970s and 1980s, and later on we started having um, you know, crystal structures of more viruses. But in the meantime, cryo-electron microscopy came into play, and this again is that basic uh, uh, schematic proposed by Crowther in 1971, which he used to, to solve uh, the cryo-EM structure of negatively stained um, uh, TVSV, this is tomato bushy stun virus. And the schematic more or less uh, is, uh, remains the same. So you have uh, a micrograph with your virus particles. You pick particles, which you have been doing. You find the center and the orientation. So you define five spatial parameters to, uh, to sort of define the position as well as the orientation. Once you know the parameters, you can try to um, have a 3D map, or you can, again, calculate the projections, and you try to match the projections with the original images, and you refine it, and this uh, cycle continues till you get a decent 3D map. So uh, the way that, uh, that uh, it was done initially by Crowther in 1971 was uh, he used common lines, which we still use to find the orientations of 2D particles. 
and then Fourier Bessel method, which I guess nobody uses anymore, to compute the 3D map and have the structure. So um, the overall method, um, I would say, remains, um, remains very similar to what uh, Crowther did. So the idea is first, again, you have been studying this over and over in, your, um, in um, the, the lectures as well as the workshops, just to, again, um, show you in brief. So you have the viruses in, uh, which are frozen quickly in vitreous ice. And uh, you have to look at the pattern of the thorn rings to see which are good particles. This is obviously very bad, uh, very bad image. So you want to get something with nice thorn rings. You can do the CTF correction. You have to uh, be concerned about astigmatism and drift and get rid of those. And eventually, uh, the whole uh, process is you have to box images. You have to assign orientations uh, to each uh, image. Then. Uh, Um, then 2D classification, initial model generation, and uh, refinement eventually to get the structural features. So this process is more or less fairly standardized. Now, uh, when we talk about uh, viruses, we want to first uh, have, once we have the images, that these are the 2D projections of the, of the 3D particle. Now, how do we actually assign the orientations and the position? So assignment of five spatial parameters to each image is essential. So the values, <coughs> um, x, y, uh, to center the particle. And then there are um, the projection angles and <coughs> in-plane angle, which have to be defined in order to figure out how your virus uh, was oriented to generate a certain projection. So for, uh, for some of these processes, you may have to generate an initial model. So how do you generate an initial model if you're working with a virus? Well, what you can do is uh, you can just download uh, an icosahedral structure from EMDB, whatever it may be. You scale the dimensions to fit whatever you think is the correct dimension for your particle. And you filter it uh, to keep only the icosahedral features. Right? You don't have any of the details of the structure. And that can be utilized as a map. Or you can randomly assign icosahedral orientations to a few hundred particles. And this way, you generate model from raw data, rather than having to use another virus as your model. <coughs> or you can compute self-common lines for a few images. And in this case, no reference model is required. So in all of these processes, I should emphasize that if you have good data, I, I have it. If you have good data, it minimizes always the possibilities of model bias. So if you're thinking that you know, we have uh, a model which might be skewing the final structure, if you have good data, the possibilities of model bias can be reduced. Also, if you really um, filter your model to make sure that uh, there are no features that are coming from the model itself. So how do you determine particle orientation and center determination? So one way is uh, projection matching and class averages. In this case, you would require a model. So uh, you take a model, you orient it in different ways, you see which one of your images is matching which, uh, project uh, which uh, back projection from the model. And this way, you determine initial projection angles, the in-plane rotation angle, and you have to center your particles. So that is predetermined. So once you, once you do that, you match the projections with particle images. You get 2D class averages. And from there, you generate a 3D structure. Again, you can refine the, uh, uh, the projection angles and get, uh, try to improve the 3D structure as much as possible. Now, the other method which was uh, discussed yesterday is the common, line method, common lines method, which was initially um, applied to viruses. And the reason it was, uh, it was applied initially to viruses was to take advantage of the self-common lines. So, um, so basically what it means is that uh, if you have these uh, 60 equivalent icosahedral orientations, each will define a plane in Fourier space. And the line at which any two planes would intersect is a common line. right? So that can be a self-common line or a cross-common line. 
self-common line is something uh, which is coming from the particle. So you are, uh, you are not uh, looking at other particles because the particle itself has a lot of symmetry. So you're exploiting the symmetry of the particle. So there can be, at any given time, 37 self-common lines. So of these, 12 are coming from pentamers. Uh, 10, I think, are coming from, uh, 12 are coming from the five folds, 10 are coming from the three folds, and 15 are coming from the two folds. So total of 37 common lines are there for any particle itself. And uh, again, in this case, you should be able to identify the center of the particle as, as uh, correctly as possible. <coughs> and uh, cross common lines, when you are uh, figuring out the, the um, correlation between two particles, and uh, you can use this to determine the orientation and the center. And again, the, in this process of common lines method, uh, rather than the projection matching, you don't actually require a model, right? So you, the particles themselves or um, have uh, the, the information required to actually um, do the orientation determination. Now, uh, to reconstruct uh, a 3D volume, so again, this was, uh, this was discussed. So Fourier space reconstructions based on the central uh, section theorem, meaning that the central section of the 2D projection of your images are going to be part of the 3D uh, Fourier transform of the 3D reconstruction. So what you can do is you can take the 2D Fourier transforms, insert into the 3D matrix, and obviously this insertion has to be based on spatial parameters. So the, go the better your spatial parameters are, the chances of getting a good reconstruction is better. And again, you have the option of eventually refining it. Uh, real space reconstructions using batch back projection is, is another method for, for getting to a 3D, um, 3D um, reconstruction. So just to show you quickly, um, just a schematic of the process. So um, the 2D projections can be made to fill or the central sections of the 2D projections can be made to fill the 3D Fourier space, which can then, based on the common lines methods, and these can eventually be reconstructed to generate a 3D volume. Now, another thing which may be very familiar to the crystallographers here, non-crystallographic symmetry averaging. Now, this is something which is a, a term borrowed from crystallography. If you have NCS in your particle, you can use that, whatever be your particle is in, in any sort of a, a crystal form. Uh, whether it be a dimer, trimer, whatever, you can do some NCS calculations. So in this case also, after you generate a 3D volume, it is possible to extract an average similar subunits so that you are improving the signal, you are improving the uh, details. Now, in, in many viruses, what, uh, what is there is that um, in addition to the icosahedral um, icosahedral capsid, the subunits which are organized in icosahedral fashion, 60, multiples of 60, whatever, there may be other components which are arranged with less symmetry or with no symmetry. So what if you want to actually see those? Because the moment you're doing icosahedral averaging, you are actually smearing out the density. So let's say you have something with five-fold symmetry. On the surface of your icosahedron, you may have another uh, protein with, which has some five-fold symmetry. So you would actually be smearing out the density for, for that component. So how do you actually um, get to those uh, components which may be less symmetric or asymmetric? So in this case, it is always possible to do a symmetry-free reconstruction. But uh, to keep in mind that uh, when you are dealing with icosahedrons or you're applying icosahedral symmetry, what you have is 60 projections which are the same. Now, theoretically, if you make this, let's say, C1, then you should have 60 times as much data to get to the same reconstruction. So this is just theoretical because in practice there may be many alterations in data collection procedure and everything, so this is not exactly uh, a, a multiple, so to speak, but you would require a lot more data in order to get to asymmetric components. And 
Another very essential thing is to optimize the signal to noise ratio of the asymmetric regions. Because many a times when you are trying to look at the particles, you may see that the asymmetric regions are more or less not in the same plane. So you're, you're just getting some difference in images. So the SNR is not the same. So in this case, you may have to play with the defocus, or you may have to have a face plate, so you can see the asymmetric components very well also. Now, how do you generate a model, again, for symmetry-free reconstruction? So you can take, let's say, there's a similar protein in another virus, or the structure of a similar protein is solved separately. So you can low-pass filter an equivalent structure and use that as your model for asymmetric reconstruction. Or you can maybe just take a geometric shape, if you have any idea what that asymmetric component is going to look like, or the low symmetric component is going to look like. You can perhaps take a geometric shape mimicking the component and use that as your model. Or you can extract shape information by lowering the icosahedral threshold of the entire map so that the less symmetric or the asymmetric components start to show up. So all of these things can be done to get a model for symmetry-free reconstructions. And again, you have to do assignment of orientations and 3D reconstructions. Now, um, another type of, uh, of viruses that we have not really discussed at all are helical viruses. And how do you actually carry out a helical reconstruction? Now, um, this I don't know much about, so I will just give a very brief uh, uh, introduction on how to do a helical reconstruction. So basically, the structure that you see there, this is a uh, tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, there it is defined by the pitch repeat and the subunit repeat. So in the transform, you have to try to see the layer lines which are corresponding to the uh, pitch repeat or and the subunit repeats. And uh, the idea is that um, <coughs> the, the number of equivalent views you have is a function of the length of the helix and the number of units per helical repeat. And uh, because all the information is contained in that single helix, the idea is that if, if, if you just have a single helix, that should be sufficient for a reconstruction. But not necessarily, because in reality, all helices are distorted. So um, a method proposed by Ed Egelman in 2012 uh, uh, divides the images of the helical fragments into short overlapping segments, and then you align the segments as separate images based on projection mapping, and eventually you go on to minimize differences between symmetry-related elements. So it's a very general procedure that I'm discussing for um, doing helical reconstructions. Now, um, based on the, uh, the procedures that we saw, the structures of... Uh, Many uh, icosahedral viruses were solved, I think, by the end of 1999, early 2000s. Um, and um, at that time, if you, I mean, if you can think back uh, that far, uh, that far long ago, there were not any direct detectors, there were not any face plates. Uh, a lot of um, you know techniques that we use these days were just not there. So there's this very old paper uh, review from Tim Baker, which shows that, um, so at that time, some people were still trying to do reconstructions with tungsten filaments. So you can see at different defocus values, just playing with the virus. Uh, this is, I think, Semliki forest virus, which is an alpha virus. And uh, what are the, the images, what do the images look like in tungsten filament uh, at 80 kV at different defocus values? And then, correspondingly, what do the images look like using a FEG source, a 200 kV FEG source? So still, efforts were going on to optimize uh, what would be the best way of collecting uh, particle images, what would be the best source. Uh, of course, direct detectors and face plates were not available at that point. However, recently, with the availability of uh, better microscopes with uh, better uh, data uh, collection techniques and all, a lot of uh, virus particles at uh, high resolution have been uh, determined. And if you want to look at the structure of some of these viruses which have been <coughs> solved recently, 
you can uh, go to EMDB or you can go to ViperDB, which is a repository for virus structures. Um, so this is a bacteriophage. This, um, I think, is hepatitis E virus. This is chikungunya, which is bound to an antibody. This is that uh, bovine papilloma virus that we were discussing. So the hexamer positions are actually taken up by pentamers. And then uh, blue tongue virus, which is a fairly large virus. So uh, one of the first uh, sub-nanometer reconstructions, and what does uh, that tell us? So this was a sub-nanometer reconstruction by La of lambda phage. And um, uh, after the reconstruction, um, so I, this is more or less application of hybrid methods that Dr. Natish will cover tomorrow. Uh, but the idea was that uh, in the cryium density, can you fit in the crystal structures of individual components if the crystal structures are known? And then whatever density is left over, can you actually assign it? So in this case, uh, uh, the connectivity between densities was fairly good. It was possible to fit in the components very nicely in the cryium map. And eventually, there were some densities which were left over which turned out to be a protein called GPD. So these, the, the structure for this was not solved before. So this was a nice hybrid methods approach of taking a sub-nanometer resolution structure of a virus, fitting in the components for which the crystal structures were already known, and then whatever density is left over to see whether that can be assigned to any component. In 2008, there was again a big breakthrough where uh, the structures of several viruses were reported between uh, resolutions of three to five angstrom. So this is uh, epsilon 15 virus at uh, 4.5 angstrom. And um, in this case also, um, although the structure conformed to what uh, it was uh, supposed to show, there was uh, one protein called GP10, which nobody knew that it was the part of the virus. But in the cryo-EM map, because uh, the resolution was fairly decent, um, it, the density corresponding to this particular protein could be identified. And then it was shown biochemically that GP10 is actually involved in cementing the virus. So it is actually part of the virus, and it holds things together. Again, in 2008, there was the structure of rotavirus solved at 3.5 angstrom. And again, you can see that the connectivity and the secondary structural elements are very, fine, uh, very nicely defined in this, uh, in this structure. In 2010, there was a, a very interesting, um, I would say, convergence or conflict between the structure determination techniques, X-ray crystallography and cryo-electron microscopy. So in the same issue of science, two structures were reported for adenovirus. Uh, the crystal structure was solved at 3.5 angstrom. And that was an effort of by Vijay Reddy for 10 years to uh, get a virus which is fairly large. So if you, for the crystallographers in the audience, you know that if you're dealing with something that is very large, it is difficult to array them in 3D and to get a decent crystal which would uh, be amenable to freezing, which would diffract nicely. Um, the diffraction would not fall off with different frames. So it was a, a, a really humongous effort to solve the structure of adenovirus at 3.5 angstrom. But in the same issue, the structure of adenovirus was solved at 3.6 angstrom using cryo-electron microscopy. And um, <coughs> although resolution does not mean exactly the same thing in X-ray crystallography and cryo-electron microscopy, and I hope somebody will, will discuss that component, but uh, there were many, many details that were present in the adenovirus um, cryo-EM structure. So you could see nice connectivity between the major capsid proteins and the minor capsid proteins. And uh, the pentan base and all were very clearly defined. Um, there were some additional regions which could not be um, visualized in the X-ray map. For example, an N-terminal region of the penton base because there were some... Um, let's say, larger amino acids which were making this region, this could very clearly be visualized and uh, modeled in the cryo-EM structure, but this was not seen in the, in the X-ray crystal structure at all. And again, uh, these are some of the minor proteins that are present in the adenovirus capsid, and you can see that the SHCs are fairly nicely defined in, in the densities here. 
And uh, again, from uh, 3.6 angstrom, now we are down to 2.8 angstrom. So these are the la latest virus structures in EMDB. This is uh, Zika virus at 3.7 angstrom, uh, which is uh, solved by Shime Lok's uh, laboratory and recently published in Nature. And this is the uh, grapevine fan leaf virus, which is solved at 2.8 angstrom. So we are gradually breaking the resolution barrier as much as possible. And cryo-EM structures in terms of resolution are uh, really approaching the resolution of crystal structures. Now, uh, when cryo-EM for virus particles was started, there were several things which were required, or let's say there were fairly uh, good reasons why people would want to do cryo-electron microscopy of viruses and not X-ray crystallography. Apart from getting higher resolution structures with less effort, the other uh, issues were um, there are some virus structures which are generated during the life cycle of the virus which are fairly unstable. And these are very difficult to crystallize because of their inherent instability. Um, as I was discussing, it is difficult to freeze crystals. The data is incomplete. To give an example from my own postdoctoral experience, I was working with a, with a disassembly intermediate of a virus. And the crystals were, so this was fairly unstable, large virus, uh, very difficult to get crystals. The crystals were very small. They could not be, they could barely be frozen. And the diffraction pattern started dying after 50 frames. The data completeness was uh, around 24%, which is considered normal for viruses. And then you have to do a lot of averaging. So there are many issues. So the idea was whether cryo-electron microscopy can help to visualize these unstable intermediates, because their structural vis visualization is extremely necessary. You may be working with a stable structure of a mature virus. However, you do not know whether the symmetry breaks at, uh, at uh, different uh, uh, con conditions or different stages in the virus life cycle. And this uh, alteration in structure may be very essential to map in order to design uh, inhibitors for, uh, for viral infection. So it is really necessary to capture um, unstable intermediates. And also to capture dynamic processes, which happen during the life cycle of the virus again, by time-resolved cryo-electron microscopy. So these are, um, these are um, let's say, intermediates or processes which really cannot be addressed or uh, cannot be addressed uh, very easily by using X-ray crystallography. So what are some of these processes that I'm talking about? So this is just a very general schematic of the life cycle of a virus. Initially, you have a metastable mature capsid, which uh, recognizes some kind of a receptor on the surface of cells. Uh, it gets inside cells. When it is inside cells, uh, either via the endosomal pathway or whether it wants to enter through the plasma membrane, it has to carry out some sort of membrane disruption in order to break open the, the membrane barrier of the host and get inside the host. And once inside, the capsid has to disassemble and release the genome. That also is a very dynamic process, very difficult to capture. But one needs to know how this process happens. Followed by, finally, replication, translation of viral proteins, assembly of virus particles. Again, the initial assembled form may be quite different from the final assembled mature form. So how does the virus go from the initial assembled form to the final form? So again, formation of the mature capsid from, let's say, a procapsid. So all of these processes need to be understood in terms of um, you know, structural detail. And uh, the structural detail, in many cases, as I was mentioning, cannot be obtained from, uh, from X-ray crystallography. So I'll just give you some examples of uh, cryo-electron microscopy, uh, where cryo-electron microscopy has been utilized to address a uh, few uh, of these uh, steps in the virus life cycle. So the first one is whether you can look at binding of receptors or neutralizing antibodies or other molecules to the surface of virus particles. So this is uh, an early cryo-EM structure. You would see that a lot of detail is missing from the structure. However, 
This is a, a, a Kalpi mosaic virus, which is bound to uh, FAB fragments from a monoclonal antibody. And if you do a difference map, or if you just look at the entire structure of the virus, in conjunction with the, with the antibody, you can see it's nicely defined and positioned according uh, to the symmetry of the capsid. Next comes um, nanogold bound to Kalpi mosaic virus. So all of these inert plant viruses are actually um, targets for um, generation of nanoparticles for various therapeutic processes. So this effort was to um, add gold particles to the surface of Kaupi mosaic virus so that it can be nicely arrayed and it can be a very bright particle. The same thing is being done with fluorescent dyes, which can eventually be used for um, medical imaging. So uh, this is to show you nanogold um, um, cryo-EM structures of virus bound to or not bound to nanogold. And if you then do a difference mapping, you can see that the, uh, the nanogold is binding at the five-fold axis of symmetry. So you can see the symmetry in the gold <laughs> particles themselves and how nicely they're arrayed on the surface of copy mosaic virus. Other examples, um, polio virus bound to its receptor, CD155. Chikungunya virus bound to uh, a neutralizing antibody. Again, it's very necessary to understand the point of contact between the virus capsid itself, proteins that are there, and the uh, exact position where antibody binds. Um, another example, so virus particles can be used as uh, sort of tethers for display of um, you know, antigenic components for generation of vaccines, vaccination purposes. So this is again an inert virus, which is bound to anthrax toxin receptor. And this is a cryo-EM structure at uh, eight angstroms, so you can kind of see how the toxin is arrayed on the surface of the virus. Now, a dynamic process is membrane penetration. So you have the virus uh, disrupting, let's say, the um, the membrane of the host cell in order to get inside the cell. So uh, here, it has been found for some viruses that the, there are some uh, small peptides which are present on the surface of the viruses which carry out this membrane penetration process. Um, I didn't, sur by surface, I mean inner surface, not the outer surface. And these are externalized when the virus comes in contact with the membrane and they start interacting with the membrane. Now, um, it was found by cryo-electron microscopy correlated with other biochemical techniques that the peptides which are organized in a quasi-equivalent fashion, and only some of the peptides in the capsid, based on their symmetry, are uh, actually interacting with the membrane. So you may have these peptides. So for example, for a T equals three particle, you may have, you have 180 copies of the capsid protein. The peptide is a component of every capsid protein, so you have 180 copies of the peptide, but at any given time, you may have only one third of those peptides based on their symmetry on the surface of the virus interacting with the host membrane. So this is just to show you a quick example of uh, the virus that we work on. This is Flockhaus virus, which is a model system for non-enveloped viruses. And uh, each, so each uh, virus is made up of 180 subunits of just one protein. And there's a small component in the protein, which is called the gamma peptide, which is involved in membrane penetration. Now, the gamma peptide is uh, organized according to capsid symmetry and the theories of quasi-equivalence on the surface of the virus. But only the peptides at the five-fold axis of symmetry, which are organized in this pentameric helical fashion, are expected to interact with the membrane. So again, by doing various cryo-EM reconstructions and mutations of the peptide and trying to uh, understand the method of interaction of the peptide with the membrane, we can see that uh, uh, the way that the peptide is arrayed and uh, at the five-fold axis of symmetry, it seems like it, uh, it forms this pore-like projection, which probably eventually inserts into the membrane and creates a, a small channel for the viral genome to pass through. Now, on the same lines, um, there was work done on um, N-omega-V, 
which showed, which did time resolved uh, cryo electron microscopy to look at membrane penetration. So, N omega V is a T equals 4 virus. It also has something like the gamma peptide. And um, this again is arranged in different ways based on the, the quasi equivalence or the, uh, the site of symmetry where, uh, where it is located. Now, very interestingly, it was found that it is possible to control the formation of those peptides. By formation, I mean that these peptides eventually need to be detached from the surface of the virus. So the process of doing that is a, a maturation cleavage. So this is part of the maturation of the virus. So the peptide is cleaved off so that it can eventually integrate into membranes. Now, in N omega V, it was possible to slow down this method, uh, this process of peptide cleavage or maturation. And what was done was a corresponding biochemical study to see how the peptide is being cleaved. So which subunits, uh, in from which subunits the peptide is being cleaved, corresponding cryo-EM, based on that exact time when we're doing the biochemical assay, you can take the sample and freeze the sample and carry out cryo-electron microscopy to see what is the status of the peptides. Are they cleaved or are they not cleaved? And this is supplemented by a membrane penetration assay. So let's say the A subunit peptides get cleaved off first, followed by the B subunit peptides, followed by the C, followed by the D. Now, if the membrane penetration is about 100% after A and B peptides have all been cleaved, what that means is you have the, the complete um, the, the contribution to membrane penetration is coming from the peptides from the A and B subunits only, not from the C and D subunits. So this is an example of quasi-equivalence. Although the peptides are exactly the same in all the subunits, not all of them are involved in doing a particular task. In this case, only peptides from the A and D subunits were involved in membrane penetration. And that was shown by time-resolved um, interaction, uh, time-resolved uh, cleavage of peptides and membrane interaction. Now, direct membrane interaction, can that be mapped? How is the virus actually interacting with the membrane? Can something like this be captured? So again, I'll show you some examples where uh, this is work done by Mohit Kumar, where uh, the membrane interaction by uh, human rhinovirus 2 was mapped. So you basically, uh, by cryo-electron microscopy, so you basically have these liposomes, and at certain conditions, you can see that these are being surrounded by, by viruses which are interacting with a single liposome. So this is direct membrane uh, li uh, virus interaction. So this has also been shown for poliovirus, and uh, there has been some uh, tomographic uh, work to show that how the virus is essentially interacting with the membranes and how the genome is coming out in, from the virus inside the membrane. Another dynamic process is the release of genome. Now, this is very, very controversial for, uh, for viral capsids uh, because the icosahedron is very stable. But when you're talking about genome release, eventually the genome has to come out. So does the icosahedron fall apart completely? Or is one part of the icosahedron less stable than the other parts? So a lot of work has been done on poliovirus, and, but other viruses have not been extremely well studied. This is one example of genome re uh, release intermediates, again, from uh, human rhinovirus 2, and again, the work of Mohit Kumar. So what you can see here, uh, is that what was done was that uh, the virus was induced to release its genome in vitro by heating or by other conditions. And then some cross-linking was carried out in order to stabilize the particles. So you could actually capture viruses at the moment of release of genome. So there were three different types of particles which were formed. There were the full particles which had the genome. There were uh, rod particles, which uh, essentially had the genome in the form of a rod right here. And then there were the empty particles, which have already released the genome. So this is a very dynamic process which is being captured, that the particles are in the process of genome release. Some of them have released the genome. Some of them 
um, are in the process of releasing the genome, and some of them still have full genomes. So this is, again, an example of processing a very heterogeneous data set to get to different structures to tell what is the dynamic process. So as I said, the, the uh, site of genome release is very controversial, but uh, now the, uh, from studies on two or three different viruses, the consensus seems to be that the genome probably comes out from a two-fold axis of symmetry by looking at these, uh, these uh, detailed structures. So to show you some of the poliovirus intermediates, which are uh, genome release intermediates, again, you have full particles, you have uh, particles which are just beginning to fall apart, and then you have empty particles, which are all classified and named according to their sedimentation coefficients. So again, cryo-electron microscopy was done at low resolution initially, medium resolution, high resolution. So the structures of this intermediate has been solved these two have been solved several times uh, with increasing resolution in each case. And now again, the consensus seems to be that uh, the footprint of the RNA can be visualized at the twofold, so it is possible that the genome is coming out from the twofold axis of symmetry. Um, um, a recent, uh, again, um, medium resolution structure of a plant virus shows more or less the, the same scheme for genome release. Now, uh, another dynamic process for double-stranded DNA phages is how is DNA packaged inside the virus? Can that dynamic process be captured? So in order to do that, we're talking about uh, asymmetric reconstruction. So this is an asymmetric reconstruction of a P22 bacteriophage so that the tail and the, uh, the portal, which is at one end of the phage, can be nicely captured. And if you look at the inner density, there seems, to be, uh, so there seems to be some additional density which was uh, not previously identified, and this was supposed to work as a pressure sensor. So when the, the inner capsid uh, fills with the genome, then this pressure sensor eventually stops the process so that more genome cannot be packaged. So this is sort of like a, like a cutoff. Uh, so certain pressure is reached in the capsid, then the packaging of genome is stopped. And uh, finally, uh, one of the dynamic processes that people have been studying for viruses, and that Professor Wachu was also talking about, if you remember from the first day, are the processes of assembly and maturation. So once a virus particle assembles, in most cases, it is not the final infectious form. There are many changes in the capsid, which eventually takes it to the mature form, which is able to infect cells. So uh, several double-stranded DNA bacteriophages have been extensively studied to understand this process. This is one schematic with, uh, with a bacteriophage called HK97, which has several different stages after assembly by which it eventually, or the, the head or the capsid eventually matures. And some of these intermediates, which were relatively stable, where uh, the structures were solved by X-ray crystallography, some which were not very stable or could not be crystallized, the structures were solved uh, at different resolutions using cryo-electron microscopy. And it was shown that uh, the structure actually goes, the head, the pro-head structure, from being a 560 angstrom um, diameter particle, eventually goes to a 660 angstrom particle, which is then cross-linked extensively on the surface so that the capsid becomes very, very stable. So there's a covalent cross-linking on the surface of the particle. Um, in several of these, uh, of these viruses, there is uh, some mechanism to, um, to uh, enhance stability, and this has again been resolved by cryo-EM. So there are three uh, cryo-EM structures here for different viruses. So in case of HK97, as I showed, it is cross-linking. And for some other viruses, there may be other proteins or glue proteins which are holding the structure together. And their positioning and all were uh, fairly nicely detailed using um, cryo-electron microscopy. Now, the process of maturation, again, as I said, particles uh, going from uh, relatively unstable assembled form to uh, a more stable form which can protect the genome, which can go out into the environment and, um, and infect more cells. So, uh, so just to show you again some, some um, cryo-EM structures. 
So this is uh, n omega v procapsid, which uh, basically matures upon decrease of pH conditions in vitro. So the procapsid is fairly large, and at different pHs, the structures were captured using cryo-EM, and the final structure. And this shows that the surface changes quite drastically, as well as the size changes, when the particles are going from the procapsid to the capsid stage. And uh, obviously, cryo-EM techniques have improved uh, fantastically since these days. So here you can only see a uh, very uh, 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 not too detail, uh, not too much detail of the surface proteins of these particles. But uh, if you remember again, uh, Professor Wachu's talk from, uh, from Saturday, uh, it is now possible to look at the secondary structure elements using cryo-EM and there's a comparison of procapsid and capsid structures from bacteriophage uh, P22, so you can tell what would happen during the maturation process. And since the secondary structure elements can be very nicely uh, computed and traced, one can see that there is distinct change in the positioning if you look at the positioning of the D loop and the E loop. So these certainly change quite a bit in order to accommodate that drastic structural alteration, which happens from procapsid to capsid. Again, if you look at these frames very carefully, so the N-terminal region definitely moves very clo much closer to the threefold uh, axis of symmetry in these particles during maturation. So now we're in, we are in a position with improvement of cryo-EM techniques and single particle reconstruction to look at very highly detailed structures of these assembly intermediates or disassembly intermediates, which would not have been possible earlier or would not be possible with exercrystallography because of the nature of these particles, which is relatively unstable. So, um, so I'll end with this. And uh, if there are any questions, happy to take the questions. Any questions? What's the average size of the capsid protein? Average size? Uh, there is really, I mean, so it's the different difficult virus to say is an average size. How um, so for most of the T equals three particles, they're usually in the range of, let's say, 40 kDa, 40 kDa, 45. But it varies from virus to virus. Difficult to say an average. So variation is huge or virus to virus? Is there is virus to virus variation, so it's difficult to say what would be an average. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the nice introduction again. And I have uh, uh, one question about the, uh, for the, uh, I don't know what's the word properly, like uh, when you use a virus like host and you have guest, uh, like, uh, not, like go down a particle example and attached on the virus molecule. Sorry? So. Uh, it's huh? Gold uh, particles. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, for example, in that example, and uh, actually it's not necessary that the gold nanoparticle attached, uh, I mean, homogeneously on the surface on the virus. And no, the so that is why the, no, that, uh, that is a good question. So if you can't just take a virus and add some nanoparticles, uh, gold nanoparticles or whatever, and they will attach homogeneously. So you have to engineer the virus so that there is a specific site for attachment. Okay. So in this case, what was done, if I remember correctly, was that at the five-fold, there was an extended uh, lysine in an extended conformation. <laughs> So that okay. was what was used for conjugation. But uh, people typically look for, uh, let's say, residues which are exposed. So let's say there's an exposed serine. So if you can convert it into a lysine, mm -hmm. or if you can convert it into a cysteine okay. for, um, for um, anything like uh, um, you know, uh, conjugation with, uh, with uh, something synthetic, like in this case, a nanogold, it could be a fluorescent dye to make an extra bright particle. So okay. these are uh, supposed to be utilizable for medical imaging purposes because it makes a very bright particle, which okay. is uh, also biodegradable. Oh. So the, uh, according to the symmetry point of view, huh. so actually in this kind of work, uh, maybe a careful symmetry uh, determination should be... Yes. 
Absolutely. So you have to have, so for engineering, actually that's a caveat, for engineering any uh, virus capsid, you actually first have to have a good structure and you have to know the positions of specific residues. So the structure of CPMV has been solved by crystallography. So that, uh, that structure is there. And I mean, when you, when you say solve structure by crystallography, it typically means that you're solving the structure uh, of the asymmetric unit. Yeah, but uh, what I mean is maybe the host and the gas have different symmetry. The host? Host, maybe the virus label. label. Label, uh, right. So uh, you, you uh, are just attaching the, the label in such a way that you are following. So if you attach something at the five-fold axis of symmetry, so you have an extended uh, residue, right? So you attach something at the five-fold axis of symmetry, then you would see that symmetry being replicated in the label. Yeah, I mean, I maybe I don't know if that's uh, clear. Maybe it's, uh, the, for example, the gold is not five-fold. For example, only one of them, it's uh, position is occupied. Uh, for the Okay. Thank you. Yeah, mixing up. The gold particles, the gold labels are about 20 angstrom, 30 angstrom, sometimes up to 50 angstrom. And we are not talking of the intrinsic symmetry of the gold label. But because the gold is attached to a certain area of the protein, and as this area is, for example, in this case, exposed on the outer surface at the firefold symmetries. If you have a complete, complete yeah. occupation, yeah. then for gold will be distributed with firefold symmetry. You mean it that it's the occupancy is not 100% yeah, full? It's, not it's another but story then. If you're doing implying a cassahedral symmetry, in this case, the occupancy is less, and that the densities symmetrize, they will be lower. So by this way, we can chart if, if, if the occupancy will be complete yes. or not. Strictly right. speaking, is occupancy is complete, 100%. In this case, the density of the gold has to dominate above the densities of the protein. But if you don't have a 100% occupancy, it's exactly like an X-ray crystallography. We are talking of the occupancy by the labels on the surface of the icosahedral virus. In this case, the density will be symmetrized out and reduced according to the level of the occupancy. Yes. If, for example, instead of having five gold particles around a fault symmetry, yeah. <coughs> you will have only two then can you imagine the density will fall down to divided by five. Oh yes, thank you. But, but uh, additional on that, if we only have two or three occupancy, maybe then we can we still get benefit from the symmetry, or then we cannot. Of yeah. We we do. So the, the, the then the. But when you two or three, we then. Well, if, sorry, I think. Yeah, so you're, you're smearing out the density, right? So if you have, for example, the bacteriophage that, uh, um, the bacteriophage head which was attached to the tail. Now the tail is only at one uh, edge of the, of the particle. If you do not... <laughs> so if you... Uh, okay. But, uh, but the point is that if you have uh, something which is not 100% occupancy, then uh, you will just see. So the density will be smeared out because uh, you're applying symmetry where there, less, where there is less symmetry. Then, then in that case, if it's not 100% occupancy, and for example, we only have uh, maybe 20% or 40%, right. so, so we cannot um, apply the uh, symmetry on whole entire it's a question of what do you want to see? For example, I want to see the if you want to see some kind of conformational changes in the capsid, possibly you can do that. If you want to just show where the gold is located, yeah. it's possible. But if you want to see conformational changes within every single subunit, it's became a tricky issue because the binding is not exactly the same in different viruses. Therefore, it doesn't matter. So, so on those lines, I'll just give one example of uh, an experiment. Say you have, um, 
you know, you, uh, if you remember Professor Wachu's talk again from Saturday, he was showing a little bit of a density extending out from one capsid, which he was calling a horn, right? So if you were to do an, um, a single particle reconstruction, let's say that density is the, the genome coming out of one end, right? So if, if it's just coming out of one end and the density is very little, right? So if you do an icosahedral reconstruction, you may not be able to see that at all. But if there are systematic changes in the capsid proteins, then you may be able to locate those changes. However, right, that was tomography, but if you are to do single particle reconstruction, and again, if you are to do single particle reconstruction with uh, asymmetric, with asymmetry imposed, then you may be able to see the density coming out of one end, provided that the density is strong enough that that can be eventually mapped. Like there has to be some way of uh, alignment, right, with the, with the density present. Oh, so I, thank you. I think I got it. I, I don't know if that answers your yeah, question, but okay. we, can, we can discuss. Uh, Excellent. Any other question? I have a very naive question probably. Yes. Um, when we talk of virus, we think of always symmetry, isn't it? Not always. Uh, not always? <laughs> there are asymmetric particles. No, we, uh, yeah, you're right that uh, there's always, uh, always some sort of symmetry, yes. Uh, either threefold, fivefold. Uh, I mean, dicocytal particles would yes. have five, three, two. Uh, my question is, is there any, is there any, so it's it's basically protein capsid and uh, genetic material inside, isn't it? Mm. So is there any virus without any symmetry? Without any symmetry. Yes, um, without any symmetry. But there is some herpes symmetry. virus. Is herpes it? virus. If it's in complete self-assembled, it's enveloped virus. Mm -hmm. Uh, NI, uh, NIH, uh, sorry, um, what's it? Uh, sorry, I have forgotten. HIV virus, it doesn't have symmetry. If you will just take a complete virus, even the core in a, um, HIV virus is completely asymmetrical. But there is some symmetry in the way the subunit proteins are organized, isn't it? Look, I mean, there is what are you talking? What do you understand? Do you look talking of the local symmetry? Even oh, local okay, symmetry okay, is okay, okay, distorted. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For example, right. herpes virus is a completely uh, yes. enveloped virus. It mm -hmm. has a lipid shell. Mm -hmm. It's which really different from virus to virus. It mm -hmm. has in, in, in inner uh, symmetrical icosahedral core, but it's even that completely, strictly speaking, it right. does not symmetrical right, because right. it has a portal protein. Right. And portal protein has a different symmetry from the mm -hmm. uh, core. If you go, go to HIV virus, the core where the genome is uh, in, in, intrinsically encapsidated, mm -hmm. it's again, you can talk, but even about the particles which are pentamers which are making the core, they are each one in a very specific position mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it really doesn't have altogether symmetry. The right, contact is right. similar but not exactly the same. Right. It's the way on which resolution you are talking about that. Right. If you are talking of, for example, resolution 7, it's possibly all subunits nearly the same. If you are talking of the atomic resolution, they are, there are a lot of kind of deviations right, right. from the perfect symmetry. It depends how do you right, start. Right, 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 absolutely. But uh, Dr. Natasha, it's uh, interesting that you brought up the genome. So uh, this is one question that I get a lot, that uh, in some of these icosahedral reconstructions, we are seeing ordered, uh, ordered genome. So how, how is that possible? So there are, in some cases, ordered genome which are associated, let's say, ordered RNA, small stretches of ordered RNA which uh, help the capsid assemble. So the densities corresponding to those, those. again, will have icosahedral symmetry. Very good. Uh, if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Dr. Mani Deepa for a nice talk and starting this.